Hello. Thank you all for joining us this evening for a panel discussion on writing trauma, because each of these writers and myself, I think, engages with the trauma in one way or another in both fiction and nonfiction. And so to my left is Leslie Jameson, who writes both fiction and nonfiction. I actually can say that for every author. And next to her is Jackie, oh my God. <laughs> Jackie, who I hung out with two nights ago. <laughs> Jackie Woodson. And next to her is Tochi Onyabuchi. And so thank you all for joining us. And I wanted to just throw out a question that anyone can answer, and that is, how do you guys think about trauma in the writing of your work? It's funny, I, I'm kind of, I start out from a very mercenary place about it just cause I work primarily in fiction and I'm always thinking of, you know, from a craft perspective, okay, how much conflict can I inject into this story, into this scene? How can I make things as worse for my protagonist as possible? Like, how can I just like ruin their life? So like, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking all these, all these horrible things that will give me the drama that I need to like get readers to keep reading and turning the page and everything. And then it wasn't until um, War Girls, my third novel, that I actually started thinking consciously about trauma. And part of that was because um, my mother was actually a kid during the Nigerian Civil War on which War Girls is based. And that was the very first time that I was like, oh, I don't know if I want her to read this book. Mm. And so that was the very first time that I started thinking about trauma. And now it's something that I that I try to treat with an increasing like seriousness and, and consideration in my work. And that doesn't necessarily mean shielding my characters from it or, or not letting horrible things happen to them, but thinking consciously about not just the like physical effects and the drama of it all, but also how does this affect them psychologically? That's interesting. I, if, when you first invited me to this panel, I was like, I don't write about trauma. <laughs> and then, and it made me realize that I'm so inside of the narrative that I'm not even thinking, well, this inciting incident is a traumatic moment for my character, or this inciting incident was a traumatic moment for me. It's just a part of the narrative. And I think that's my way in. The first part is that my um, protagonists survive to tell the story so we can exhale, right? So you're going in from this place of even though something may have happened, this person's gonna be okay, except when you come to a book like If You Come Softly where um, it's the story of a, a relationship and one of the main characters gets killed. And, and, and in that case, um, I told it from third person, so so I told his side from third person, I told his girlfriend's side from first person. So in, in the telling of, in that first person narrative, you know someone has lived to tell this story, and then eventually you understand that the third person is there because that person didn't live, but someone carries that story, and so the story still lives. And so I think it's that place of hope that there is survival inside the trauma that is my kind of entry into the narrative. Yeah, I mean, just listening to you guys speak is already kind of giving me new ways to think in interesting ways. I mean, as I was, I, I, I certainly really connect to that kind of um, deep interest in modes of survival and, and really a deep interest in like how uh, when I'm writing about the trauma of other people. I think as I was thinking about my own relationship to writing about trauma, I was thinking, okay, how do I write about it differently in fiction? How do I write about it in nonfiction when the subject of that nonfiction is my own experience? And then how do I write about it differently when I'm writing about other people's lives, which is also part of my nonfiction practice, kind of as a critic or a journalist or amateur journalist or however my so I want to deflect certain titles as they come at me but um, I was thinking you know I am really always curious when I'm asking other people who have lived through really hard things like how 
what were some of the surprising ways you survived? And I was thinking about this woman, Leonora, who I spent quite a bit of time talking to and writing about um, as part of an essay about, of all things, a whale, this sort of notorious whale who became known as 52 Blue. He was like a blue whale who was remarkable because he was always tracked alone. Most whales travel in pods. This whale did not. He was always on his own. His song was also at a higher pitch than any other whale song had been recorded at. So this narrative developed around him like he was an outsider. He couldn't find his people, his whales. Um, he couldn't be understood. And I became really interested in the sort of ragtag crew of people across the blue globe who had become obsessed with this whale. And one of them was this woman, Leonora. So in a way, I didn't, who had gone through this massive trauma. She had had a debilitating Ill experience of illness that had resulted in her being in a medically induced coma for six weeks. When she came out of that coma, she basically had to relearn how to do everything, how to walk, how to speak. Um, and this, and she found the story of this whale in the midst of this recovery process. And I think that was what was part of what was compelling about her story to me was like she she had fallen apart in all of these ways. And part of the way she came back was by finding a narrative out there in the world of this other creature who was not only unlike her, but in many ways unknowable to her, but that had become one of the materials of her survival. And I think after I wrote that story, some, when I came to other stories of people who had lived through, you know, um, death, abandonment, um, various forms of violence, like I think I always was interested not just in like what hurt, what was hard, how did it challenge or render precarious your sense of self, but also how did you build a new self in the aftermath and what were the materials from which you kind of cobbled together that sense of self. Um, so those those questions geared towards, you know, and maybe it connects Tochi to what you were saying about kind of harm, being interested in harm and impact, but also like how does this traumatic experience carry the story forward? Like it drives narrative, but in carrying the story forward, there's also that aftermath of like the self who rebuilds and like makes new ways of being in the world, you know? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, like Tochi, also think of it as, okay, how am I going to just make the very worst possible things happen so I can find some story in there? But it, it, it also, I recognize, has to be more than that. And about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, Perul Segal in the New York Times Book Review wrote uh, a great essay called The Trauma Plot. And in it, she was primarily writing about A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who has read that novel. I love it. But it's horrifying. It's about like 800, 900 pages and the worst possible things you can imagine. And then even worse than that happened to this guy named Jude. And you keep thinking, wow, why does she hate Jude so much that she's torturing him in this way? And one of the things that Perul comes concludes is that oftentimes writers are using trauma as a plot without doing anything more, as if trauma is inherently interesting. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do in your work to ensure that trauma is more than just a situation, that it becomes a story? I mean, I'm, I'm drawn to what uh, Leslie and Jackie have talked about in terms of the after, because I think it's the after that's really interesting to me, particularly with regards to survival. So like, I think most obviously in Riot Baby, there's this sort of ambient trauma of growing up in like, you know, 145th and St. Nicholas in, in Harlem and having to deal with all the, you know, all the oppressive mass of of the threat of in, the constant threat of incarceration, you know, oppressive policing, um, you know, people that you've grown up with just vanishing from your life either to to death or illness, you know, at the drop of a hat. Um, and how do they how do they get older in the midst of that? How do they grow up in the midst of that? Like. For a kid who's literally born in the middle of the Rodney King uprising, like, how does he grow up? Who does he grow up to be? And I think one of the main vectors that I wanted to explore there was different ways in which people deal with the anger 
that can come out of the traumatic experience or the sort of ongoing trauma that they're experiencing. And I also wanted to sort of shy away from the idea of, of a sort of responsible way of dealing with anger. Like I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to see what would what it would look like if I let if I let these characters have the freedom to be irresponsible with their anger. Like what would that look like on the page? Because like I see that in real life. Mm -hmm. Like I've been that in <laughs> real life. Um, and I think that is one of the ways. And because I I feel like with with some trauma narratives or with narratives that where trauma is at the center, there's a sort of cage that's put around the character to whom the trauma happens where they're only afforded a certain range of responses in the course of the narrative. And for me, like, at least when I'm writing, it has to be about the freedom to like be irresponsible with your responses to, you know, your trauma. I love, there's, yeah, there's so much in that. I both love that question, Roxanne, and, and, and also where it took you, Tochi. And yeah, I think I, yeah, I think there's something really powerful and ethically useful about kind of allowing characters, whether they're real or imagined, to be free of that kind of cloistered space of like, these are the acceptable, responsible, appropriate ways to respond to hard things. And I think there's this, deeply toxic kind of cultural fantasy of like the innocent victim or whatever that has done just like a thousand different kinds of damage in a thousand different directions. This idea that like in order for somebody's victimhood to be real, they have to be sort of like angelic. The idea that anybody's innocent of anything, like we're all culpable and harming and complicated and, and you know, a swirl of many things at once. And, you know, so that, so, and the idea that too, that like the most, that we somehow should make trauma and its residue like pal palatable by making people only behave in certain ways. And I remember I was writing a profile once of a woman um, who had been left by her husband when their child was very young and, um, and then had sort of found love again in the aftermath. And as this new love was actually literally in the driving the moving van to set up their new home he had been killed in like a frontal impact car crash and so and I had met her kind of a year into the aftermath of this second trauma and I remember her talking about how she felt so kind of claustrophobic in relation to everybody's demand that she sort of be resilient, that she be like bearing up well and kind of taking care of her daughter and being an example. And everybody was so invested in her, in how strong she was and how, how much of a model she was. And she was like, actually, wh why do I have to perform this kind of really resilient, admirable self? Like, I don't want to be admirable. I want to be like, angry. Like, I want, you know, like, and, and, and I really wanted to, give her the space, at least in the piece, to be all the things that she felt like she wasn't being allowed to be by other people in her life. And so I think thinking about some of the things I think about like on a craft level in writing character in general, again, whether it's a real real character or imagined, but certainly writing characters kind of going, moving through truly difficult experiences is like, how do I let you be a lot of different ways at once? How do I let you be kind of unpalatable and uncomfortable and producing discomfort and reader, you know, just kind of like let it, letting, letting the vectors of a character point in lots of different directions and kind of not making them bear the weight of like proving um, a moral or like, you know, tying up the bow of like hard things happen, but then we get this nugget of wisdom or insight or hard things happen, but then people survive and we get to turn them into our role models. Just like letting, you know, letting people be messy and letting them be fall, fall apart sometimes and not asking them to be entirely cohesive or together. I'm, I'm thinking about um, how we as writers, it, and, and this is what y'all were saying, speak to the complexity of character so that their trauma isn't their only thing. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and I think that's what we do. So for me, and I'm also thinking about, for me, in doing it, I, I'm separating the writing I do for young people 
are two young people with the writing I do, two adults. And the thing about when I'm writing, two young people, they are in it. So they don't have, they, they can't look back on it, right? So they're in it in their resilience, in all of their um, open pain, and, and getting through it on that very kind of immediate level. Um, and then when I'm writing for adults, they have come through it. So are, are they're, they're in it in a different way. Um, I'm thinking of another Brooklyn where the girls were, they go from being 11 to being adult women and just you know thing after thing after thing happens to them. But um, I don't always feel like I need to answer the question of what became of them in the end. Because, because it's a narrative just and, it, and it's a continuum. So I can talk about it in the moment of whatever it is. And, and for the young people, I don't know who they grow up to be and what they look back on, except for the latest book because it breaks the rule of uh, children's fiction and that it's an adult looking back on a time. Whereas when you're writing for young people or two young people, they're in the moment of the years that they're in. So if it's an 11 year old, they're 11. They're not going from being 11 to 15 or 11 to 13 even. They're 11 years old, that's a year in their life. Um, and, I, and so when I'm thinking about how I go into telling their story, it is with that immediacy of them this is, this is the trauma they're in in the moment, and they're going to get through it in this moment. And, and what you're not going to see is, is the baggage they have as an adult. Um, and when I'm writing for two adults, you are in that moment. You don't always know what that baggage that got them to that moment is, but, that, that, but you know that maybe something new is happening that ignites a new kind of trauma, and then that's what they have to get through. But again, I think coming from writing to young people and adults, there always has to be that hope there. Um, that is the thing that allows them in some way, shape, or form to survive. You know, it's interesting because I'm often asked, I think many of us are, are asked about hope and what role hope plays in your work. and. You know, especially in my fiction, it can be a little hopeless at times. And in my novel, my first novel, An Untamed State, it's about a kidnapping. And uh, a woman is kidnapped while leaving her family's house in Port-au-Prince. And she's with her husband and her infant son when this gang kidnaps her. And she's held for 13 days because her father refuses to pay the ransom. And it's a very long 13 days. And... So the novel looks both at what happens to her during the kidnapping, but also after. And I was really interested in the after because like what Leslie was talking about, a lot of times we do tend to idealize people who have suffered. When like, if you're an asshole going into an experience, you're probably gonna come out an asshole again, but just with like even more trauma. Mm -hmm. And so as I was thinking about writing about this woman's experience and how she endured it, you know, the reality is that she didn't come out okay on the other end. And the novel doesn't have a tidy ending where everything is much better and everything is going to be fine. She is going to be okay. That's what I tell myself because I made her up. But she's not necessarily going to be whole again. And as I was writing her kidnapping experience, I remember thinking, I want this to be unreadable. I want people to know something truly horrific has happened. And I was thinking of this very terrible movie called Irreversible. I don't know who's seen it, but it's a really graphic, horrifying movie that starts at the end and goes back to the beginning, which actually makes the horror of what happens even worse. Mm. And I remember the director saying in an interview, he wanted it to be unwatchable. And it is truly, the violent scenes are truly unwatchable. And that was my guiding principle when I was writing the violence in the novel. I wasn't trying to titillate, but I didn't want, I wanted you to look away. I wanted you to cringe because assault is assault. It's not a fun experience. And at the same time, there are writers who write around trauma or are not explicit. 
And that's okay too. There are so many different ways to approach it. So how do you guys think about explicitness when writing about the challenges that we face and the traumas that we deal with or that our characters deal with? You know, I, I, I can't do it. I mean, I, I don't, I can't watch scenes on a film. I can't um, read, um, I can read it sometimes if, if there's some white space for me to exhale. <laughs> um, but I can't, I really have a hard time going directly into the eye and writing from that point. And for, for me, it has to be the language that um, when you step away, you're like, oh shit, what just happened? You know, so, so it has to be this kind of slow ebbing into it um, that, that resonates in a way, but it's really hard for me to write graphically uh, um, about trauma. I've never been able, I've never been able to do it just because I, I don't know how because of course you learn to write by reading and seeing and, and I, I don't read that and I don't see that. Um, and even when I'm watching television, like my poor family, I'm like, tell me when the violence scene is over. Tell me when I can look again. And that's always been how I've been. I mean, it's, it's funny, I'm a bit like the MPAA, which is like, I can do violence, but like, I'm a bit prudish sometimes. <laughs> but like, in, in all serious, I've never been able to, I've never been able to, and part of this is just that no narrative that I've written has ever demanded this of me, but I, I like can't, I can't bring myself to do sexual violence in a story. Like, I, I just can't, it's, like a wall between whatever skills I have as a writer and what that depiction would demand of me. And I just like, and again, part of it is that I, no narrative that I've constructed, whether in an essay or novel, a short story, has ever like put me in that position. But, you know, in a book like War Girl, which is, you know, YA, there's like amputation. Mm -hmm. Like it's like very, 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 um, graphically violent, but at the same time, for some reason, that's just easier for me. And I think part of that is just socialization and just like the way that we've been. So I remember this might have been like 2013, 2014, but it was like a Jason Bourne movie had just come out. And it was a, a Matt Damon, Jason Bourne movie. And I remember watching it and being like, this movie, and maybe I had just gotten like older, but I was like, this movie is really, really violent. And then I saw that it was like PG-13. And I was like, where have we gotten <laughs> as a society? <laughs> where? But like, I remember being like very viscerally like impacted by the violence in that movie. And like, I'm a kid who grew up playing Mortal Kombat. Like that's... Like that's that's like I grew up playing Mortal Kombat 2 and doing like practicing fatalities on like my best friend, right? Not like in real life, but like and I think again part of it is that like socialization, which you know comes with this incredible facility with like you know physical violence and like Tarantino-esque type stuff. Mm -hmm. Um but at the same time in all matters regarding um like sex, for instance, or any sort of stuff surrounding that, there's this prudishness that comes in. And I think I'm very much like a product of that socialization. And so it shows up in my fiction, or that dynamic makes itself evident in my fiction. Mm -hmm. But there's one thought that I'll share, and then I have a, also kind of a question just inspired by some of what you were, actually some of what all three of you were saying, but. You know, as you were talking, Roxanne, about wanting, wanting to write in your first novel like this, wanting to, wanting, wanting it to be unbearable, you know, in certain ways, and wanting, wanting in that way to do justice to something about violence, assault, and trauma, and um, it reminded me of uh, a. a one of the reviews that came out of my essay collection, the empathy exams like 10 years ago um, said, you know, maybe some people will call this collection unflinching, but I think it flinches all the time. It's constantly flinching, but that's part of its strength. And I actually really liked that distinction. I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm an, un I don't think I aspire towards an unflinching 
gaze when it comes to pain. I think I aspire towards a gaze on the page that's like constantly registering the flinch, like the kind of like, I, I want to turn away from this thing. Do I turn away from this thing? The fact that I'm fascinated by this thing, is that is that morally useful or is that troubling? Like the And the flinch, I think for me, takes lots of forms, maybe most often a kind of self-interrogation or like the mind, especially in essays, like the mind kind of turning on itself and being like, well, you write about wounds over and over and over again in these essays. Like, why is that? Like, why, why is culture so interested in like a particular kind of wounded woman, like, and in keeping her wounded maybe, you know? So I think sometimes for me, the flinch can take the form of like dramatizing a thing and then questioning how did I dramatize the thing or like allowing space on the page to kind of um, um, maybe write a scene and then interrogate the scene in certain ways. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about a scene where like um, in my book, The Recovering, which is about uh, addiction and recovery and creativity. And But there's one moment where I narrate, I don't know whether I would, I don't think I would call it a trauma but maybe that's part of the point of the scene it's like a scene of unwanted sexual contact contact and um I I both narrate this night with this uh man and then also really make room on the page to say look I don't know what to call this experience I don't know does it count as date rape? Is that claiming a level of trauma that's not mine to claim? Um, but it was important to me to kind of let that wrestling or that lack of resolution or that sense of kind of categorical uncertainty to put it there rather than feeling like I needed to resolve it in order to write the scene because I know, I think probably everybody in this room knows many, many women who have struggled with the question of like, what's the right word for this? Do I get to use this word or am I not allowed to use, have I not earned that word? And so I was like, yeah, I wanna narrate a situation that feels to me still a little indeterminate in what I even wanna call it. But but in that sense, I think that's like another kind of flinch. And I so the flinch is not a way of like shying away from something or not, owning an experience, but it's, 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 I guess, not forcing a feeling of resolution onto the experience, whether that's emotional resolution or intellectual resolution or sort of analytic resolution. Um, and then my question, I guess, especially in terms of thinking about, like, you know, I was thinking, Tochi, when you were describing War Girls and writing violence, but also writing violence for a YA audience or thinking about you writing kind of the writing the unbearable with a fair amount of intention. I wonder how you distinguish between writing violence, like wanting to be willing to be graphic about violence and to let true difficulty on the page, but how to write it also in a way that doesn't sensationalize it or in a way that, you know, how you think about writing it for a younger audience, how you think about kind of allowing characters, as you were saying, Jackie, to be kind of dimensional and multifaceted and not sort of overly defined by the violence. You know, that's a good question, and it's one that I'm primarily concerned with because I do think that there is that line between information and sensation, and I, I don't want to cross that line because when people write about trauma or suffering in ways that aren't as effective, you know, when you read it and you're like, oh, this is great, like, no, something went awry on the page. Someone, like the writing process failed. Mm -hmm. And so I think really carefully about that. And one of the ways I think about it, many years ago in an in interview about writing about sex, um, Alexander Chi was writing about James Salter's A Past and a, a Sport in a Pastime, which is this beautiful, beautiful, sexy novel. And he said that when he writes about sex, he kind of closes the door a little so that you're only peeking through a, a little slot in the door. You're not like seeing it full on. And so for me, I, I, I try to keep that in mind. Yes, I'm going to be explicit about what I show, but you know, it's not, if like something goes on for hours, I'm not going to give you hours of prose. I'm going to just allude to really the extent of what happened. I'm going to sort of be explicit within the context of opening that door a little bit. And I oftentimes will like cut off a scene and then move forward in time. Mm -hmm. That way, you know what happened. You're clear and we're not going to stay in it. We're going to see sort of where we go next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for me, I guess the 
the thing is consequences, right? Like what are the what are the consequences for the character committing the violence um, in addition to the character who's suffering the violence? Um, you know, because then it's not just a question of of agency and imbuing you know certain characters with you know the power to do certain things. But I think that it's like you know nobody nobody's ever seen John Wick go to therapy. <laughs> like, could you imagine ima if that man just like sat down and like thought about it? The fact that he's like reduced New York City's population by like a good eight <laughs> percent. Like, you know, he's never had to like. And, but that would be a different movie. Like, that would be a very, very different movie. And for me, that's, like, the difference between, you know, sort of sensationalized and intentionally so, but, like, sensationalized, stylized, like, oh, this looks really cool type deal, and, like, something that's a little bit more, you know, I don't want to say ponderous, but something that's a little bit more considered. Because, like, there are parts of War Girls that I wanted to read, like, the anime that I watched growing up. Like, I'm a huge Gundam fan, and there's a lot of Gundam in War Girls. Um, but also, too, it's a novel about, like, child soldiers. And, like, Gundam is a show about child soldiers, but, like, they're 15 years old. Um, but I also wanted to treat these particular child soldiers with seriousness and consideration and empathy. And I think I... I saw a way to do that by looking at the consequences, um, not just of what they're going through, but of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting that you bring up empathy, because I do think that's a real consideration when writing about trauma. And one of the ways I like to think about empathy is in recognizing that no one is all good or all evil. And unfortunately, a lot of times when we're talking about trauma, in both fiction and nonfiction, people tend to be very black and white about it, extremes, no gray areas. Um, which is not to say that there are gray areas about certain experiences, but that no one is wholly evil except for perhaps Trump. So, um, <laughs> just facts. I mean, I can't, <laughs> not my fault. Uh, so, I, I think of uh, the writer Therese Melo, uh, who wrote a great memoir a few years ago called Heartberries. And one of the things she talks about is holding herself accountable. And also admitting, you know, here are the ways that I've been harmed. Here are the harms that I've done. So how do you guys think about balance and empathy, not only for suffering, but for those who cause suffering? So um, what was the name of that memoir again? Heartberries. Heartberries. Weird title, brilliant book. Okay. Um, you know, it's funny. I was writing a picture book called Each Kindness, and... Um, and I was trying to write about, I was trying to think of, um, I started writing it because at the time my daughter Toshi was in second grade and this kid comes in and she's wearing these really cool pants and of course I'm the mom in the classroom, I'm like those are really cool pants and this other girl who doesn't hear me is like, oh I can't believe you wore those ugly pants to school today. And, and I watched for the whole time the girl Michaela, who had the pants on, kept trying to sit down, like stay by her desk or tie a jacket around her whenever she got up. Like she, her day was gone. And the girl who said it had no clue. And, and, and I started thinking like, when were, was the time when something like that happened to me to try to get myself to think about it? And all I could think of was the times that as a kid I had done stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so that, and, and, um, and, and began writing the story from the point of view of the kid who was unkind. And I think that, that kind of interrogation for writers happens all the time, right? Because you do have to have these um, multi-dimensional characters and, and starting to think about, for me, thinking about that in character, that, that character who's not likable. I mean, this was a character who was not likable in the end result for her was regret and remorse, right? Um, um, but but I don't I think I might have just lost the trail the strand of the question. But but I do think a lot about how 
do I create these characters that are flawed, right? That um, have fatal flaws sometimes and are still able to move through the novel in a way that keeps them interesting. Um, and I also think that you really, I find I really have to love the character. Uh, no matter how despicable they seem to be, because if I'm just writing from this place of deep dislike for them, I'm going to create a one-dimensional character. But once my emotions, to, my feelings toward them are complex, then it's, I'm, I'm able to create a more complex character. I love that. I love that story about, I don't, I was like, I was, aching actually at the this image of the scroll who's like trying to cover her pants up after they've been insulted but I what I love about the story is that when you tried to imagine yourself into a position of having been harmed there was a part of you that instead moved toward accountability and like re recognizing these moments when you had been harmed and I just feel like the world would be a better place if everybody sort of naturally moved towards their accountability Rather than, you know, I think there's a place also to like recognize and own the ways one has been harmed. But I totally agree that the kind of project of writing characters that are complex and both harmed and harming is like one of the great projects of literature. And one of the things that literature is really equipped to do, like can do can do more f more fully and richly and with more layers than almost any other mode we have um and i was thinking about two recent projects like one the uh, memoir of mine that's coming out next month is this book called splinters it's about early motherhood and also about the end of my marriage and i thought a lot about accountability when i was writing it because like no matter what i do it's always going to be my version of a story. Like when you write personal nonfiction, you kind of have to own that, I think, that it's like subjective. It's not going to be equal. It's not going to be equally representing other people's points of view. But I think within that, you can, without pretending that you're speaking for anybody else or fairly representing where they're coming from, I think you, you can try to think as hard as you can about what was it like for them and what also did I... What harms did I cause? But I'll always remember this piece of really useful feedback that my editor gave me after he read an early draft of the book. He said, you know, something I noticed is that when you are dramatizing some of the harms that were done to you, you're very specific. They are in scene, very granular, we're getting quoted dialogue, and that there are these other moments where you talk about the harms you did but they're always abstract. It's like the word harm is showing up. It's very general and it's very vague. And it feels like you're trying to get credit for me. He didn't actually say it quite this way, but I heard what he was saying and he was right. He said, it's like you're trying to get credit for being the kind of person who holds yourself accountable for the harm you're done while also kind of corralling all the readers to be on your side. Because of course what sticks with a reader most firmly are these very specific dramatized moments. And I was like, you are 100% right. This is like the worst of both worlds where it's like I'm trying to kind of garner all the reader's sympathies for me while also trying to kind of like virtue signal that I'm like aware of the harm I've caused. And I was like, I need to be much more specific. I, I, I felt that I needed to do a few different things craft wise I needed to and like human wise too I needed to be more specific about the harms I'd caused I needed to, and I also needed to like let the other figure at play be more things on the page I needed to give him some really good moments I needed to give him tender moments I needed to give him funny moments all these things that were true and um, that would just allow him to be more than kind of a you know more than a villain um yeah also working on a piece about gaslighting right now, which is like a real adventure. Um, but in addition to being interested in, you know, the complicated and toxic manipulative dynamic that is gaslighting, I'm really interested in like 
the kind of appeal of constructing other people as gaslighters. Like um, when I put out a kind of crowdsourcing call for gaslighting experiences, I got, you know, a hundred people saying, I want to tell you about the time I've been gaslit. And one guy who was like, I think I gaslit somebody once. And I was immediately so interested in him. I was like, that's it. You know, I was interested in everybody's story, but I was like, there's something here that you went to that place of being like, when did I make somebody else feel bad versus, you know, when did it happen to me? Yeah. Uh, so was was the question about empathy? Well, d how do you think about <laughs> empathy yeah. and no? This is all accountability. I mean, this is all. I'm like taking. I'm taking copious notes because, like, so I I've written a lot of. I know, right? Because <laughs> um, I'm I'm much more familiar with writing fiction than nonfiction, but I'm starting to get into my nonfiction bag, and so like. I, this is like an accelerated education um, in many, many, many ways. Um, but for me, the the empathy thing, and this is sort of a, a cause and a consequence of it, is like thinking of my characters as constellations of experiences rather than a sort of linear because this happened to them, then they're this way, and then they're this way, and then they're this. Because like the thing that really, really, really grinds my gears is when you have this like, villainous character right like super 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 villain except when this happens in anime like in anime it's it's like <laughs> i like it but outside of that like you'll have a you know tv episode or a movie you have this like really horrific or horrible character and then there's like some flashback scene that reveals oh this horrific thing was done to them and that's why they and like nobody's i don't i don't know personally anybody in my life who's like the way that they are because this one thing happened to them, right? And so that's the thing that I try to do the opposite of. I'm like, this is the this is the miasma that you're coming out of, or this is the like combination of miasma and like joyfulness that you're coming out of, or this is like the mixed bag that you're emerging out of as the character in my psyche. Um this I can this I can work with, as opposed to like, oh, you got your arm chopped off when you were younger, and so now you're like this, and you're like the bionic badass, and what? Like, no, you're you're a bionic badass, but because you know all these other things happen to you, and not just this one horrific thing. Um, so yeah, constellation. Well, thank you. I'm sure the audience has questions, so if you have a question, just throw your hand up, and we'll see how we can answer it. That's a really good question, mm -hmm. which is really, how do you think about personal boundaries when you're writing about trauma? Mm -hmm. And I think about it a lot, personally, um, because you do need to save something for yourself. You don't have to cannibalize yourself and, and expose yourself to an, uh, you know, an anonymous audience just to write about your trauma. And so I just make sure before I write about something, if I'm writing from personal experience, to be very clear with myself, what am I trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Like, why am I sharing this story? Because, again, trauma is not inherently interesting. It's actually pretty fucking boring, like, to live through it. It's like, oh, this. Okay. And so you have to really, I have to have a clear sense of purpose in doing it. And then I also say, what am I comfortable with the worst asshole on the internet knowing? Mm. Because I can assure you, the worst asshole on the internet will find it and use it against you over and over and over again in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So that is a really useful question um, to ask yourself. And so that I use those sort of guidelines as I'm writing, and that really does help because when I put something into the world, it may be uncomfortable when people engage with it because you can't control what the reader's going to do, but I know that I'll be able to survive it, mm -hmm. and that's important. Yeah. I think I echo what Roxanne says so 100%. And I also... Um, I read it out loud with no one in the room. <laughs> so I read it out loud to myself to see how it sounds and how safe I feel hearing it in the world. And if I come to lines and phrases and parts that don't feel safe, I rewrite them or decide to take them out. Um, but it is, I, I, um, 
once because once it goes into the world, like Roxanne says, it's it's not yours anymore. It belongs to everyone who touches it um, for the good and the bad of that, right? Because so many people need that story, and then um, so many people are going to um, do what they want with it. So it is it is about feeling safe with what you put in the word in the world, and for me listening to, hearing it in the world is very helpful. I love listening to both of those answers and I just love the question too. It's a really, um, you framed it so eloquently and it's a really important question to ask and it's actually a demonstration of, I think sometimes why narrative can be powerful is like you put something into the world that resonates with other people and it makes it feel there's a kind of companionship in it and even just like putting forward a question like that in the room so, that so many other people I'm sure have some version of. It's like a kind of companionship to speak it out loud. So thank you for that. And um, yeah, I really um, agree both that it's important to figure out uh, what you can share and what you need to keep for yourself. I love that practice of reading it out loud and just seeing how it feels for it to exist in that in that audible way um and I would just share two things one is really connected to what you were saying Roxana about asking yourself like what is my purpose in writing this um I always think about when I'm, I I I ne I've never written personal narrative because I like the idea of writing personal narrative like I've never been like oh what I want to do most in this world as an artist is just share my business um but it so feels for me like so I, I'm interested in exploring questions and sometimes for me the, the way that I feel I can most effectively explore a question is by whether that question is about like what is empathy or what are the limits of how fully we can ever understand or imagine another person's experience or you know what did it feel like to get sober or what you know it's sometimes the most useful materials I have at my disposal are my own lived experience but I always think about it as um, deploying, I hate that word because it's so military, but sometimes I use it anyway, deploying my own experiences in service of a question. And that helps me actually to think about what needs to be there and what doesn't. Like which parts of my experience are helping me illuminate something about this question. And then the other parts of the experience are sometimes the parts that I keep for myself, but the parts that I'm putting out there, I feel when I'm more aware of the work that they're doing, it helps me kind of stand behind those experiences being out there in some way because I feel like I know why they need to be there and that helps me put them down. Um, and then the second thing I was gonna say is about form and structure. And for me, like sometimes certain kinds of material, using a more fragmented structure helps me keep some parts of it for myself. Like the, the book that I mentioned earlier, Splinters, is told with what I think of as these like splinters of text, like very short pieces of text that are maybe a paragraph, two paragraphs, a page. Um, and by telling it with these like sharp whittled moments rather than like a chronological narrative that was giving you like every everything for a two year period, I allowed myself to say not say a lot about the end of my marriage because I knew that wasn't the story I wanted to tell and I knew that was some of the material that for a lot of reasons I really wanted to keep private but I also didn't want to give a reader that really frustrating experience of like not getting the full story you know and by finding the right well, I mean I hope I don't know I can't I can't, I can't say what anybody's experience the book will be but my hope is that by um kind of giving these these small shards of experience, I could give a reader an emotional experience that felt, you know, like it had a lot of layers in it without giving them every bit of the kind of dramatic chronology playing out. And that helped me keep, keep some of it as well. Yeah, that, I mean, that's such, like, that's such a good and important question. And it's one that, like, I, I've been thinking about increasingly. And there, there are sort of two aspects of my answer. One is a sort of process aspect and the other is a result. And I'll deal with the result first. So back in, I want to say like 2019, I'd written this essay um, about 
playing The Last of Us as a way of coping with the death of my father when I was young. And it was the most personal thing that I'd ever written. And it was about like grief and the, the way that he passed and the sort of my own uh, weird and circuitous process of and occasionally unhealthy process of dealing with that and all this all this stuff right just like really putting it out and um i know you never read the comments or you're never supposed to read the comments it's like do rule number one do comments. not read the comments but <laughs> on this particular essay this is the and this is the the one time that i've allowed myself to do this. on this one particular essay um there was a comment from a woman who basically said that uh her son had gone through something very much like this uh had lost his father when he was younger and had retreated into video games and for a very long time this son was a mystery to his mom and his mom said that reading that essay had given her a potential glimpse of what her son was going through. And that, like, just, like, it was, it was maybe, like, two, three sentences. But, like, that, I was, like, that's probably the, like, favorite piece of nonfiction that I've ever put out in the world um, for that reason. So that's the result thing. So... If that's possible, then like I'm like, okay, I might be doing something right. And the process part of it is that for me, um, every single piece of writing that I try to put out into the world has at least some joy involved in its construction, no matter how difficult or how like, um, how like again how difficult or what have you it may be to read in the end or even like put together writing for me is ultimately like a joyful thing it's the thing that i love to do more than anything in the world like there there are easier ways to make money there are easier ways to get famous like i do this shit because i love it mm -hmm. and if i look at a piece of writing particularly one that you know one in which i wear my heart on my sleeve a lot or whatever um, or that can feel a little uh, vulnerable or even a lot vulnerable. If I don't detect any joy in, in the construction of that thing, if it feels like it was drafted entirely out of necessity, then I don't need it to be out there. But if there is, if I do recognize that kernel of joy, that like little nugget of gold in there, in the process of its drafting, then I'm like, okay, this, and it's like really mystical. It really boils down to like, did this feel good to write? Yeah. Um, and if it did in that really sort of primordial way, then it's something that I think I'm comfortable having out in the world. Thank you, guys. Uh, any other questions? Yes. I was wondering. So one thing I learned as a young writer was you ask yourself the question of why is this story happening now? And why do you feel compelled to tell it now? So what's the inciting incident that makes you want to tell this story now? Um, and that's where you start from. So that's where I, I, that's how I approach it. It's like, where are we in time and, and why are we telling it now? Um, and, and, and I also think that cobbled with the hero's journey um, where you're, the, for those of you who don't know, I'll just give a quick rundown of the hero's journey. You have your protagonist. They're in their ordinary world. They're in the house with their family. Something happens. The house burns down. Someone comes home again. Um, something changes, right? And it can be a small change or a dramatic change, but it's going to change that protagonist forever. And so what is that, what is that thing that happens that sends your protagonist out on this quote-unquote journey? And what, by the end of the book, what is the thing that they returned with? What's the elixir? How are they different by the time they come? So I, and the other thing I ask is, what does my character want? How are they going to get it? And that's the narrative. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I especially in fiction, I ask myself, if I'm gonna write where the character's looking back, or if I'm gonna rely heavily on flashbacks, why? Mm. What does that remove provide for the narrative that not putting the reader directly in the events does? or doesn't. And so for me, it's really just thinking about what is the reader gonna get? And more often than not, when I do ask myself that question, and most of my fiction is short fiction, 
you know, the answer is, oh, it's actually not necessary and you're relying way too much. And also in screenwriting, I, I rely way too heavily on flashbacks in my screenwriting, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. But I then just think, okay, let, if I took away the flashback, if I took away the thing, how would I impart to the reader the thing I'm trying to show them by showing them this thing? And if I have to let them know exactly what happened, then I just will create a scene. It won't even be a flashback. Like, I'll just be like, 1999. Mm. And then it, it's less obvious than that. And then move back to the present. Or I just realize I don't actually need to have anything to do with the present. The story is whatever it happened back in the day. Um, and that really just helps. Mm. Yeah, I mean, for, and this is part of just like tools that I learned in fiction, occasionally migrating into the nonfiction. Like, for me, it's unless I'm being intentionally oblique with the sort of blending together of past and present, or I'm in a situation where I want to make clear that there are certain past episodes that are bubbling to the present or what have you, I just try to be as clear as possible. Um, and sometimes that means just like, hey, in the year 2014, like this thing happened. Then so like just being as clear as possible, because like, I want to make sure that if I'm conveying, if I have a specific point to convey, particularly in a scene or a sequence of scenes or whatnot, I want the reader to be able to like get the point. Like, I I don't necessarily want to be one of those writers who like hides the ball from the reader and is like, you figure it out. So like, I think clarity for me is probably like the biggest tool there. I love that you all mentioned. 2014 and 1999, because I always <laughs> think, you know. What happened what in those happened. years? <laughs> but also, you have the, you know, you have so much context, right? Once you have the time, so much is happening in the world around you, so you have all of this fodder for telling your story. And those were some interesting years. They were. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great question. Um, Leslie talked about it a little bit in terms of um, you know, story can take so many forms, like splinters, splintered, or it, splinters, splinters yeah. is is written in that fragmented way. Um, you know, hunger is. I, I like to think of hunger as almost vignettes, but um, and then um, and brown girl dreaming is written in in poetry and those three memoirs. Um, so so you can choose. So you can't have all kinds of ways of writing it. Um, I would question why there wouldn't be dialogue in, uh, di in diary entries, but it could be, it, it doesn't have to be there as long as the story, you know, is moving forward. I mean, that's how I would look at it. There's not one true form for the memoir. There are lots of ways to tell that narrative. Yeah, I'm basically like a whatever works kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it's an interesting question because um, I, yeah, I both very much agree with what you were saying, Jackie, about, you know, the, the and really both of you, the many, the you know, that there is no right answer to the question of form and there are many different forms that a memoir or a novel or really any genre can exist in. I think I would, um, I would also echo that sense of like maybe dialogue, could exist in a in a diary entry I think um you know I but if you if there's not dialogue I, w I guess I would think about this question of like why what are some of the things that dialogue offers a text and are there maybe other ways of bringing those into the text if there's not going to be dialogue so for me at least some of the things dialogue brings into a text is like if it's a first person narrator dialogue allows the kind of certainties and internal monologues and thought processes of that narrator to be interrupted by the perspectives of other people and to be challenged usefully and kind of uh in a way exposed as only one perspective by the, the the dialogue of other people. Dialogue gives a first person narrator a chance to like give other people the best lines or great lines or perspectives or insights that aren't coming from inside the narrator. So all of those are reasons dialogue is useful. If there's not going to be dialogue, are there other ways that that kind of perspective rupturing can happen? Mm -hmm. And then the other question I would ask is like, what is it in in craft if if there's an impulse to craft a structure around diary entries why you know and not in a challenging way but just like what do you want that form to do for the narrative and in in maybe naming that 
the the purpose there, it also opens up a question of like, are there other potential structures or angles of approach that could serve that purpose? Which isn't to say that then you end up dismissing the form of the diary entries, but just that you sort of like open up the field of possibilities to think about if I want to provide a really intimate experience, if I want to get deep into a particular consciousness, just as an example of a, po a couple of possible intentions that diary entries could serve, like there are many ways of doing that and let me just consider all my options. I'd also recommend the book The Folded Clock by Heidi Julevitz, which is, told, stru is structured as a series of diary entries. Yeah, and I would say just briefly that um, whatever you do, just do it consistently. Mm -hmm. You can do anything in prose or poetry, but I don't know anything about poetry other than reading it. In prose, you just have to be consistent. You have to teach your reader how to read your book. And like everyone else, I would say you can also include dialogue in diary entries. Be like, Tom said, mm -hmm. and then Peter said, and then Marissa said, and I said, yes. Ooh. Well, <laughs> I mean, if you don't want to get written about, don't do something worth writing about. <laughs> I mean, that's my general ethos. Like, don't start no shit, won't be no shit. Um, that said, what I try to do is be fair and be honest. And the reality is, with one exception, no one in my life have I ever had an experience with that was completely evilly one-sided. There was only one. And I could give a fuck what they think. Um, but with everyone else, I am fair. And I'm honest. And that's hard. It is hard to be honest with yourself, to hold yourself accountable as much as you want to hold other people accountable. Mm -hmm. I, also re I also try to have boundaries. If I'm going to have boundaries for myself, I should respect the other people in my world enough to have boundaries for them as well. Um, and there, for example, my parents are very private. I love them. And there's nothing I need to unburden myself of with regards to them that I would put on the page that would then compromise my relationship with them. It's just... I have a therapist. Mm -hmm. And so I just stick to those boundaries and also do unto others. Like mm -hmm. if the roles were reversed and someone was writing about me, what kind of care would I want them to take? Mm -hmm. And so I use that as a guiding light and I try to take the same care. And so far it's actually been fine. Tochi? Also too, like, and this is, I mean, this is just something that I, developed from fiction that again migrated to my nonfiction. I try to be clear about the perspective I'm writing from. Mm -hmm. um, so like in fiction, you have point of view, you have POV, and you know, depending on the type of story you're telling, you want it to be clear in every scene who's the point of view character, even if you're writing in like third person limited. And I try to take a similar um, approach into my nonfiction where I try to be as clear as possible that like, look, this is me with my faulty memory and my like amateur journalism and like not being an eidetic like whatever 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 wonder kind who remembers everything this is the guy that's telling the story um this is the guy whose opinion you're listening to on this thing this is the guy with necessarily incomplete information who is doing this thing now that the disclaimer is out of the way, here's this banger of an essay for you to read. Like, that's sort of how I try to go about it. And he's telling the truth. I'm um, publishing his next nonfiction collection. Um, and that's exactly how he does his essays. Yeah. <laughs> I would just add to that. I mean, I would echo um, uh, what has been said, you know, both what you were saying, Roxanne, about... Um, trying to be honest and fair and allow you know other people on the page to be complicated and what you were saying Tochi about you know being clear about the perspective you're writing from and um yeah and I would just add a kind of a, a process thing that I do and I really think every writer of personal nonfiction comes to their own process around this and I don't think there's a right answer around sharing work with other people not sharing work with other people it, it, yeah, everybody has their own way and maybe sometimes it's different in different cases. I try to, um, when, I, when I've written personal nonfiction that other people appear in from my life, I share it, I offer them the chance to read it. 
um, kind of well before it comes into the world so that there's, so that it's not just a heads up, but actually is still a work in process where there's time for me to edit it. And what I offer them, and I've gotten really careful about this language, I don't offer them veto power, except in a few cases I have. Um, but mostly I don't say anything that bothers you, I'll take out. Any, you know, anything you disagree with, I'll say what you think instead of what I think, like, because that's not actually what I'm offering, so I don't offer it. But what I am offering is like, if you wanna read this, I am open to hearing your thoughts and reactions and editing with those thoughts and reactions in mind. And, and that's what I try to do. And so I, do, and I, and I almost always change some things either if they remember something radically different than I do, I kind of, if it's a detail that doesn't feel essential, I'll take it out. Or sometimes I'll incorporate some part of their perspective into the, into the narrative again, fully understanding that I'm not then offering just as much something as their perspective as my own. I, I think it's disingenuous to present it that way. But I, I allow, I do allow their voice into the text and, and places where they've given pushback. I, I do see it as a, as a useful corrective sometimes to the ways that memory is always sort of aligning the story to my own agenda. So I, I, I have that process in place. And in addition to maybe doing whatever complicating work it does, it actually weirdly allows me to draft more freely, knowing that some version of that process is in place because there's not some part of me in the first draft, for example, where I'm always trying to think, well, what would so-and-so say about how it happened and trying to anticipate what would bother them and what, you know, how they might say it. Like I'm I just, I just write it. I write it more freely because I know that there's this other part of the process coming. And the last thing I'll say is like, I've learned that like, really, I cannot predict what reactions people are going to have. Like things that I'm sure will bother them don't. Things that I never would have imagined bothering them do. And that in and of itself has been a really useful, sometimes I think somebody will be bothered by that. And they are. But like, in general, it's a kind of a useful humility lesson that I don't, I I, can't, I just can't predict. I don't know other people, the inside of other people's minds, and it's it's a it's a generative kind of humbling to be reminded of the limits of my ability to imagine their minds. But at the same time, going back to a point of view, it's your story, right? It's your set of memories, and um, I, I I just remember writing. When I was writing Brown Girl Dreaming, I, you know, I have three other siblings, two are older and one is younger, and they had different memories of some things because of the way they could comprehend from their age. Um, and I had to keep saying, Jackie, this is your, so what is, what is your memory of this? What was your experience of this? And, and then what is my story? So I have a younger brother who had really bad lead poisoning all of my childhood. And he also had a different father. And I knew that the lead poisoning was my story because his illness impacted the whole family. But the telling of the story of his father was his story. And I, I, don't, go, I don't go there at all. And, and I, I just made a decision, like, these are the stories that have an impact on me and I need to tell. And, and I'm going to have this kind of respect for the stories that maybe they want to tell one day. So that's also another thing to think about. And also point. think about the fact that they might not even read it. Like, half my family does not read my writing. No, nope, no, nope, mine neither. <laughs> I wish I could say that. But I, I, the only book I ever told my parents not to read was Hunger. Mm. And I told them what was in the book. They've been at the book launch, both for the hardcover and the paperback. I've toured with them. And they've, so they know, but I was just like, you don't, there are things in there you just don't need to know about your daughter, but you can go to church on Sunday and you won't be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. um, we have time for one last question. Oh, oh, no. oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> now you guys have questions. Yes, right there. That's a really great question. The question is, how do you write about trauma in ways that don't further desensitize readers to trauma and violence? It, it, I'm very curious as to y'all's answers because I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say the same. I, I think every piece that I do, I try to just take care. And for example, I write a lot, unfortunately, about police violence, police brutality, the murder of black people uh, extrajudiciously. 
um, judicially rather. And so I think about, especially now, and I, it's evolved. So if you look at my earlier work, like when I was writing about Michael Brown, it's very different from say when I wrote about Philando Castile, because I do think at some point the specific recitations of what has happened, we already know. So instead, what is the broader cultural condition that has brought this about? How do we mourn something that is ongoing and for which there probably is no end in our lifetime? So I try to look at other questions. I do say, here's this thing that happened, but I don't dwell in the violence as much anymore. And it start, I started to do that when Tamir Rice was killed in uh, Cleveland, because his mother has been very vocal about the ways in which some public figures have co-opted her son's story. And I never want to be in that position where I'm not thinking about the fact that, yes, this is a news story, and my job as an opinion writer is to engage with it, but there are also families and friends and community around it. And so I try to be as mindful of that as possible so that I'm not exploiting something, because there are things that we already know, and the details are not as necessarily important as the injustice behind it. And also, I um, like to think, once you sit down to put pen to paper, you're on a journey of healing. And the reader is on that journey with you. So you know, even if there is something that is the inciting incident that is about trauma, you're already in the process of moving past it. And that's, the, and, and that's where the hope comes in, that's where, you know, even the journey comes in. And I think that be, being in that place is already doing the work of making something less violent, less traumatic, um, just because there's the balm of the narrative. Yeah, no, I think, I think that healing part is really important. Like, listening to y'all's answers got me thinking. I think that ultimately the answer for me so far at this point in my journey as a writer is... And this is, this is helped by the fact that the novel as a form affords me a lot of space and like a whole tapestry, you know, to, to work with, is that there's more than just the traumatic act or the effects of the trauma. Like I've, it's become more important to me. Like particularly if you look at, if you look at like Riot Baby and then you look at Goliath, there were maybe like, two parts in Riot Baby that like made me laugh. And there's like a whole bunch of scenes in Goliath that made me laugh. And you could argue that Goliath is ultimately like the more depressing novel. <laughs> but like I, the point that I wanted to make with it is that there's more than people suffering at work. And like, I think that's true of just like life in general. Like there's more at work than what hurt us. There's more at work than the hurt that we do. There's more at work than the bad stuff. Like, there's this good stuff, too. And I think trying to keep that in mind helps, like, oddly enough, make the tragedy more poignant, but also um, is as important a reminder as I could ever know that there you know, there's more than that. And so it's one of those things where it's like a de desensitization so that like the bad stuff matters all the more because I know there's either this good stuff that I stand to lose or this good stuff that I've gained coming out of the bad stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tochi Onyebuchi, Jacqueline Woodson, and Leslie Jamison. And thank you all for joining us with your excellent questions and engagement this evening. Um, the author's books are all available for sale, and they may even sign them for you in the lobby. Or, I mean, it's not really a lobby, just outside of the room. Mm -hmm. And thank you again for coming this evening. <laughs>